afternoon, everyone. My name is <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Blake Aldridge, and I'm the uh, webinar coordinator. I've been coordinating uh, this series of webinars that we've been doing this summer. Um, this is our third and final webinar of the summer, and uh, you can always go back on uh, the previous webinars tab on the Forestry Webinars uh, homepage and look for the the previous two, which are Treasuring the Trinity, Challenges and Opportunities, and then Turning Your Land into a Sponge, which uh, would be most useful for cattle producers um, as we continue to deal with this ongoing drought. Um, and lastly, I want to just mention on October 2nd in Athens, uh, we'll be hosting the Trinity River Land and Water Summit uh, alongside uh, Trinity Waters, which is a landowner conservation organization based in the Middle Trinity River Basin. Um, and so this will be a free event. It will be all day. Uh, some key speakers are Bob McCann, who is president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and uh, Todd Staples, who is the Texas Agriculture Commissioner. And so we got some great speakers, and we'll also be talking about uh, maybe doing some future watershed planning work in uh, some of the watersheds throughout the Middle Trinity River Basin. So um, that is something to be sure and attend. And I'll uh, be, you'll see me be putting a lot of links in this uh, chat box, and so I'll put the link in there for the news release and the registration page. Uh, but without further ado, um, I'll pass it off to Dr. Jim Cathy, who is uh, the Extension Wildlife Specialist here for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in College Station. Okay, thank you, Blake. Can uh, everyone hear me okay? Maybe use that clapping icon there under the moderator's name. All right, looks like everyone can hear me just fine. Listen, I really appreciate you carving out a piece of your day with us to spend it learning a little bit about uh, what's going on with, with Texas and its water and its wildlife. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to go through a bit of introduction, uh, kind of think about where we are with water, and then later on visit with you about some organizations and conservation success stories that we've had in our state, and then perhaps end it with some specific uh, examples for wildlife management. If you've been to some of my seminars in times past, you know that I love old photos, old uh, newspaper clippings, things that allow us to spy on times past. And this is one that I found when working in Uvalde, Texas. It's the Texas Stockman and Farmer. This is the 1908 edition of the Texas Stockman and Farmer, and it was quite a deal at that day. You purchased the entire year for only a dollar. But the photo, I'd like you to focus your attention in this background here. There's uh, not a lot of, in fact, there's no uh, diesel or um, gasoline powered equipment. We have uh, various types of technology in the screen. Uh, for instance, over in this area, we have this gentleman in a horse drawn. Looks like he's plowing up portions of that pasture. Um, there's a wind energy that's prevalent in our state these days. You can see it up in the background on the upper left. Uh, drawing water from the ground, and then this, this uh, in this case, four-strand barbed wire fence has a lot of relevance for Texas as well. Note that the icon for this particular newspaper is this longhorn bull located right in the middle of the screen, and note that it wasn't many decades before 1908 that longhorns and bison in, fr in front of them kind of ruled the day in Texas and shaped how our state looks like today. In the back of that newspaper, I found this article, this uh, advertisement by the Leona Land Company there in Uvalde, Texas. And I'm, I'm just astonished by some of the land prices and land holdings that we see in this part of the world. Uh, for instance, 43,000 acres in McMullen County sold for $7 an acre. Uh, LaSalle County, one of, the, one of the places that deer hunters seek, 66,000 acre piece of property sold for $6 an acre. And then in Chambers County, a small piece of property, only 10,000 acres, sold for $20 an acre. And uh, those people in that area recall that in 1908, 
that's the birthplace and that's the timing for the Texas oil industry. So perhaps there was some land speculation going on at that time. But note this advertisement as well. Uh, much of the properties that they have are riverfront, located along the railway. This is the best belt in southwest Texas and has some fine small farms. Um, you know, it must have been alluring. Often I, I take myself back to those early times in Texas and um, I wonder what it would be like. And so if we look at Texas from up on high, it looks pretty, pretty good, pretty healthy. You can pick out some of the higher rain belt areas, right? Like over here in eastern Texas where we may receive uh, 50 to 60 inches rainfall in a good year. And as we move westward, that rainfall begins to dwindle uh, to as much as maybe 10 centimeters or 10 inches of rainfall there in the Trans-Pecos portions of Texas. But I can imagine myself uh, entering Texas from those first early days and wondering what it's like and, and seeking my fortune. And that's what we have here in this particular slide. This is also from the Uvalde area. Uh, these steel wheel tractors, think about that from being around 1900 to the 1930s and then we got into some better rubberized mechanisms and uh, more um, advanced farming techniques. But there's a lot of stories to be told here. Think about those folks who are seeking their fortune in Texas. And the further west that you went, the lighter the rainfall became. And so some hardy individuals here. Um, there's some, these farmers, you can bet that they're also cowboys. And they've chased their cattle through the brush there in southern Texas. But my ladies in the audience, um, how do you like these bonnets that the women are wearing? And aren't you astounded by how white their aprons are, even in this dusty, portion of Texas. Now this particular slide has significance to me as well. This one, uh, I didn't know that mechanics made pasture calls, but in case this, this, this one surely does. Um, I believe this would be a 1908 Ford Touring car. And um, this is a, a pasture there in, in western Texas. You know that Junior here Junior convinced his father into buying this contraption and taking it out there along the landscape. And uh, this thing is broken down out there in the pasture. You know that this mechanic is feeling the pressure. He is feeling the pressure. He's afraid that Junior has a, a pistol on his belt line somewhere. And then I want you to take a look at the expression of father here in his derby hat, his long black coat, uh, just wondering where his horse might be. How far is it going to take him to get back to the ranch and get rid of this contraption that's, that's come out there? Note that this is a good year in, eastern, in western Texas. There's forbs here, some different types of forbs that have grown up in this area. But these types of things allow us to spy on the past and see what's going on in Texas at another time. Back then, they came to Texas or bust. There was a, a large influx of folks that came into Texas seeking their fortune. And that's not unlike we have it today. There are a large number of people that come from other states to Texas, as Texas' economy has been able to remain um, in pretty good shape over the last few years. Our oil industry is booming right now, and uh, those folks are, are investing their time and their successes here in our state. And with that come some challenges, of course, how we provide water to all those folks, and, um, and then also instill uh, a stewardship quality that we have regarding our wildlife and our land practices and letting them understand how we operate and uh, the different aspects that come into everyday management. You know, I can imagine myself there on that border riding into Texas on my horse, uh, and this is what, in my mind's eye, Texas looked like. Those prairie systems that stretched not only from eastern Texas, but throughout the western side of the state as well. And so there's an appreciation that I have, and I know by visiting with many of you, that you have the same sense of appreciation for some Texas resources as well. And that may be some of the draws that people have to come to Texas. Wide open spaces, the, and considering some states the land may be cheap. Uh, now those prices have escalated dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. And so we no longer see $6 an acre there in, in LaSalle County. I bet those prices are fetching somewhere between three and $4,000 per acre instead. But there's also this agricultural way of life that we have here in our state. And I think that every kiddo ought to have the chance to hand paint a horse. And so, um, so th that would be just fun. That would be that connection to the landscape that our folks might have and as they seek opportunities here in our state. 
but we've certainly had an appreciation for wildflowers in our state. Given ample rainfall, we have some beautiful locations, and our blue bonnets are just known about their quality there in the hill country. And a number of other flowers, as you see here, Coryopsis and, and others, Indian paintbrushes and uh, Indian blankets and so forth. Our wildlife resources is all, are also a draw for those who come to Texas, and they seek the opportunities to hunt white-tailed deer, like this pretty good buck near Uvalde, Texas. And of course, we have mule deer and a lot of other natural resources as well. All those folks who have come to Texas have their footprint. And I wanted to show you the nighttime illumination that we have here in our state. This is a, a map developed by the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources. But it's easy to see and pick out the towns or cities of Dallas. You have Houston down here in the southeast. You can pick out San Antonio in Austin, and you can go further west, and you pick up towns such as Amarillo, um, Lubbock, Abilene, San Angelo, and others. And so, you know, for me, I would love <laughs> the first person running around Texas to see its resources and what it is. And uh, whenever I see photos like this one with nighttime illumination, it makes me wonder just how far we can stretch Texas's resources. Now here's a, a, a quote that I found just here recently. I want you to show me the water. And the primary message of the 2012 state water plan is a simple one. It says, in serious drought conditions, Texas does not and will not have enough water to meet the needs of its people, its businesses, and agriculture. And that leaves me wondering just exactly where does wildlife fit into this? I uh, have to assume that's associated with the agricultural aspects that we see in this slide. But this is playing out right now. There are some locations in our state where uh, agricultural water uh, may not be reaching its, its end. Agricultural water that might have been used for livestock um, and, and then recycling that water for waterfowl purposes, um, in some cases that's not available this particular year. I wanted to show you uh, another strain on Texas is our, our population has grown dramatically. And so currently we're sitting at about uh, all, about 26, 27 million people in our state. And our population has grown dramatically uh, over time and is projected to, to be much higher than that by 2030, somewhere between 34 to 40 million people in our state. And of course that's going to have uh, huge demands on our resources. Now take a look at the graph in the lower right as well. Another item that's happening is that our, our rural people in Texas have dwindled over time as a, in, in the opposite direction, our urban residents have grown over time. And so that's not a big surprise to many of you here. You saw that nighttime illuminescence. But there's, there's decisions that are made, um, decisions on landscape that are made um, that we need to pay a lot of attention to. That is, our representatives are more in those urban areas than they are in some of the, the rural portions of Texas. But the two, of course, are interconnected in a huge way, and I want to explore that a little bit more with you. Now, um, this slide shows three boys jumping into Canyon Lake, and I know these boys well. The kid that's upside down right there is my son, Jared Cathy, and uh, then we have his, my nephews, uh, that are in various states of jumping into that water. And I guess I'm thinking about those urban folks that are out there. Now these kids live in the country right at the edge of, of, uh, of, of a pretty major town. And, uh, but still, there's some things that are going on in this slide that these boys are blissfully unaware of. Can you see this background here? Do you see the shoreline in the background, which indicates the lake is at least 15 feet down? And that's just a dramatic loss of water in these reservoir systems. And so I guess what I'm telling you is that there's a message loss between those who may be well connected to the landscape in rural Texas as opposed to some others in urban areas. And that's a message that we need to um, explore, find ways to communicate better. And I know many of you are involved in that. So if I told these boys that there was a drought on, they would have no clue. If I told them that 2011 uh, had a, uh, the least amount of rainfall on record, that it was a data point by itself, it would be on lost years there. They wouldn't understand what I was telling them. And it's no wonder, right? Because if you work with, with anyone, they'll tell you that 
if I turn that spigot at my kitchen sink, water comes out of it every single time. What do you mean we're in a drought? No, I turned that water spigot on today. In fact, I saw my neighbor watering their lawn. Everything seems to be fine. But of course, uh, that's not the case. We are under some major water restrictions, as noted by the state water plan. But also take a look at the monthly drought outlook. Um, here we have the range for range through September 30th. This was released August 31. And here in Texas, we're still in uh, an area where drought pers persists, and it looks like it's going to intensify. So we're not out of this by any stretch, and it takes good land stewardship to be ready to capture that rainfall when it does ca come. Now, I want to commend the people. It looks like those folks in Big Springs, Texas, have been hating themselves. They've been doing right and received a little rainfall. So how would you like to be in that circle there in Big Springs, Texas? Also, I want to show you this particular slide. Um, this, uh, this one shows the drought impact on Texas surface waters. And I want you to pay particular attention. I'm going to come back and focus on the Trinity for much of the rest of this presentation. But I want you to see that you know, if you're in areas of orange, that you're in um, severe drought. That if you're in areas of red, you're in extreme drought. And so there's some locations, say, from uh, Milam to Madisonville in those portions of the world where uh, you are in desperate need of a, a nice, slow, soaking rain. But this drought has, has not broken, and of course this has an effect on our wildlife resources. Just think about the economic value of Trinity Bay down here in the lower left-hand corner. The Galveston and Trinity Bay it counts for millions of dollars to our state's economy on an annual basis. It wasn't too long ago that I went out on my back porch to my uh, some plants that I have there, and I saw these water droplets there on the plants, and I, I couldn't quite focus on what the red things were, and then I recognized that they were they were ants that were, um, you know, just reminded me of of cattle at a water trough lined up taking advantage of that water. And I thought to my, my boys and my nephews that were jumping off that clip who were blissfully ignorant as to the, the scarcity of water that we have here and how well these ants were behaving themselves one beside the other, getting a drink of water and, and taking it on. It just amazed me that big or small, right, big or small, the water is hugely important. Even these droplets, as small as they may be, has a, a big meaning for these particular animals. So let's take a quiz right quick. Let's take a quiz. Use your, your icons, as Dr. Taylor alluded to earlier. Which is the only natural reservoir in Texas? Is it A, Somerville, B, Toledo Bend, C, Livingston, or D, Caddo? Good. I see some answers coming in. And Jim, I'll publish those to the screen here in just a second for all to see. Okay, great. If, if you want me to. Yeah, absolutely, Eric. Thank you so much. Everybody, come on. Let's get an answer. Don't be shy. <laughs> yep. So to, to give an answer, they go to the A, scroll across the letter, click it, and away they go, right? Right. Right. Okay. Good. So yes, um, Caddo Lake is the only natural lake that we have in our state, and so um, I guess for me, what this means is we got to think back to what our carrying capacity is for our state, as far as us humans are concerned. And so I guess I want to I want you to scratch your head just a little bit. Did we exceed our human carrying capacity in the state when the first reservoirs were built here? And so, you know, many of these reservoirs were started uh, to be built after the drought of the 1950s. Some are a little bit older than that, but primarily after the drought of the 1950s, and some as early as as uh, the 80s and 90s. All right, all right. Well, let's see. As a bonus question here, which one of these reservoirs is in the Trinity River Basin? Which reservoir is in the Trinity River Basin? Good. I see a few answers coming in. All right. C is the the predominant answer by our our, our folks out there, except for all you shy ones that did not answer. 
and uh, see Livingston, like Livingston is in the Trinity River Basin, so you're right about that. Very good. Okay, let's see what else we got going on. So I wish I wish we could answer all these questions. I would like to know how many other people on here today are also in the education business in one form or another in your agency. I suspect that, that some of you are. I know that I saw some master naturalists on the line as well, and I know that you're in the education business, and please understand how much I appreciate you reaching out to your peers in the delivering education to them. But, but this slide depicts kind of the way that I feel sometimes. I feel like time is melting away or time is slipping through my fingers. Um, it's difficult to, to reach all the people that I want to reach. And I know that there's this need of conveying what good land stewardship on rural lands means for water consumers and users in urban areas. And I don't mean for that to do just be one direction. There's a communication, a line of communication that needs to go back and forth across those two audiences. So let's take another little quiz here because those water resources are meaningful, right? So which of the following are ecosystem services? Is it clean air, clean water, outdoor recreation, or all of the above? Okay, good, good. Let's see some answers coming in. All right, great. And Eric, thank you for putting that up there. Yes, everyone recognized those as being D, all the above. All those items are ecosystem services. All right, so now think about how you would couch the argument that open space lands are meaningful to Texans. It's hard for people to, to grasp that ecosystems function naturally to do many of the things that we need. We, we seem to be disconnected from the landscape. In fact, most people in Texas are two or three generations removed from agriculture, and they do live in those large urban areas. And uh, so um, all of you educators out there, please help me convey the importance of those open space lands and the ecosystems and their functions and the services that they provide. And I bet some of you are entrepreneurs out there. Sometimes I think that there has to be another model. There has to be another model placed into play that uh, conveys good land stewardship. Now, wildlife has really taken off in the last 15 to 20 years, and people are doing an awesome job managing like never before. There's a hunger from those folks that have uh, some of those perhaps being off the landscape and now have purchased their own piece of land. Jenny Sanders, a friend of mine, would call those folks reborn to the land as opposed to those who may be on the land for quite some time. You know, the, uh, the hundred year ranches and farms out there are just special. And so I would think of those folks as born to the land. I have some of those people who are switching what they do as well. And I had one gentleman call me and said, you know, we fought the predators and we fought the drought, and we fought this, that, and the other, and we don't want to do that anymore. And wildlife was an option that, that they were embracing and taking on and switching what they do. And I think there's a lot of room to mix um, compatibilities between livestock and wildlife and row crop farming, and there's a number of people who are doing that. So let me ask you another quiz question. Which one of these landscapes is better prepared to capture rainfall? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I won't wait for the full response on that, but yes, absolutely. The slide uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, the A is much better prepared to receive rainfall than some of our urban areas that are having pervious surfaces. And if you've ever drowned your vehicle, you would know that, um, that that was not any good. But would you make a connection that these landscapes over here in Section A might prevent some of the flooding that we see in our urban areas? By the way, this slide that you see in A, that is within the Trinity River Basin. And uh, this, was, this photo was lent to me by a friend of mine, and, and uh, just appreciate him allowing me to use that. But yeah, absolutely, when rainfall comes, this place will act like a sponge, much like Blake Alders mentioned earlier, uh, modifying your property to act like a rangeland sponge. You know, there's a, a number of groups out there in the state that promote conservation, 
in agriculture, and I've been fortunate to work with the, the good people with Trinity Waters for some years now. Trinity Waters evolved from a wildlife management association. There's a number of people that are involved in this, and if I start naming names, I'm sure that I'll forget someone and hurt someone's feelings, but uh, I'll just tell you that some of my heroes are involved with Trinity Waters, and some of my heroes have been involved in the development of this. Um, there are over 30 conservation organizations that have showed support for Trinity Waters in some form or fashion, be that monetarily or by helping them build their capacity. And these landowners in the Trinity River Basin, mainly the middle basin is where uh, the majority of their activity is right now as they, they head toward the, towards the northern basin as well. But uh, they operate to and are dedicated to improving the quality of life, the economic sustainability, and the ecological integrity, integrity within the Trinity River Basin. And so they have done some extraordinary work, and they have amplified the voice, the amount of attention, the amount of um, communication that has gone on with the Trinity River Basin and the connection between the landscape and water resources. Now, I want to show you what the basin looks like. There's about 38 counties that touch the Trinity River Basin from the northern end, and Monte and Cook counties and Grayson County to its southern end here in Chambers County, where land used to sell for, what was it, $20 an acre for a 10,000-acre piece of property. I'd like to have that today. But um, think about the population centers in the Dallas and Fort Worth areas. You know, I, I put a, a sign there, a city limit signs for Carrollton, Texas, and I'm sure that they, they love their area there around Dallas. There's a lot of, of cool things about being in that part of the world. But I'm here to tell you that the folks around Corsicana, Texas, and Navarro County are just as passionate about their piece of property, their country way of living, their rural way of life. And in fact, some of these folks in Carrollton, they love what's going on in Corsicana as well. And some have been purchasing their own piece of Texas in that area. Now, the Trinity River is hugely important. It runs about 512 miles from the edge of Oklahoma all the way to the Galveston, Houston, Trinity Bay complex that I mentioned earlier. It has over 1,900 miles of tributaries that feed that river system, and the land base is pretty immense, over 18,000 square miles. It makes up the Trinity River Basin. That's about 7% of the land mass here in our state. What's more important about the Trinity River? Uh, somewhere around 45 to 50 percent of the state's population receives their water from the Trinity River Basin in one form or another. So it's hugely important for those aspects and the ecological components that I mentioned as well, feeding that estuary and bay system. Now the folks at Trinity Waters and some of their partners have been busy connecting people with the Trinity River. And um, if if my, I grew up in Falls County near Waco, Texas, and when we went to the Trinity River, we were headed towards Crockett, and I was white bass and crappie fishing with my, my mother and father, and we had a wonderful time fishing there in that part of the world and caught a lot of fish, but if you were headed towards the Dallas area and got closer to Dallas, sometimes the Trinity River didn't have the best reputation. It had some problems up there. And so among the, the if, I, if I put a couple of classes on the Trinity River, and maybe I jumped over to the Frio River, well, the Frio River or the San Marcos, those are easy to swim in. They're easy to tube. Uh, that water's clear running, and it's cold, and it's beautiful. Well, there's portions of the Trinity River that are absolutely beautiful as well. It may not be very clear, but it has a different component. It has a different meaning to those who use it. Those in the Trinity, uh, with Trinity Waters promote land stewardship practices. They're trying to improve ag production and do that in a, in a way that mixes with wildlife populations. It'd be great to increase some wildlife populations in that area as well. There's a number of recreational values that the Trinity River has, and I think that there's more that can be enhanced in this area. For instance, it's one thing to fish or duck hunt along the Trinity Basin, but what about getting our folks in the Dallas area and Fort Worth area to come out here and kayak and introduce them to some water sports and water activities? Um, all these things, the land stewardship that I've been talking about, all those will increase the, the natural state of the river to reduce the pollutants in that area. It's just a better overall uh, system that we could put into play. Over the last few years, 
our work at Texas AgriLife Extension Service has been funded through a, an EPA 319 grant administered through Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. And it's allowed us to help Trinity Waters build its organizational capacity. And we've worked hard at developing resources and making those available to Texans across, uh, across the state, of course. And so I want to visit with you about our, our web presence, our advances in social media, some of the videos that we've done. Um, some mapping services that we're, we do through the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources here at a and uh, our publication series, and our outreach programs geared towards youth and adults. Up until a few years ago, our website with Trinity Waters um, was going okay, but like many websites that you may go to, sometimes the activity might not be uh, what you would see as, as, as being very active. With the advent of this support from Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board, we created a brand new website for Trinity Waters. And I want you to just kind of note that their uh, mantra, land, water, and life, all those things are connected in a huge way. Um, this website is updated almost on a daily basis by our own Blake Aldrich. And you can see that our water summit is coming up in October 2nd there in Athens with those speakers that he mentioned. And you don't want to miss that opportunity to learn a little bit more about what's going on with the Trinity River. There's um, things that describe the river basin itself. There's a landowner library with over 400 publications that people can pull through. But you'll also see the events down here in the lower right. We, we, we uh, change this thing daily. We have a lot of activity. And so I want you to know that you have a wonderful resource to pull from when you're ready. Our social media aspect is kind of new to Extension. Uh, over the last four years, we've been sticking a, a toe in testing the waters, if you will, in, with regards to social media. But now it's become a way of life. And so we have presence with our Facebook. We have a, a online newsletter with the use of Scoop It, where you scoop an article from the internet. Our Wild Wanderings blog we created in 2008, and now I believe there's over 290 articles from various aspects of wildlife biology and management. Our Twitter account is active. Our YouTube channel is growing by the day. And there's a number of Trinity photos to show those beautiful aspects that people might not know about in our Flickr photo account as well. So just a couple of things. Um, any, any of the good work that's done, know that that's because of the good people around me. And so uh, what you see here with this Twitter account is Blake Aldridge, who's already put out over 5,600 tweets. He has uh, 600 people, 640 people that follow him on a daily basis and receive information about what's going on with weather or climate or some legislation that may affect uh, water policy in the area. So Blake's done an outstanding job with our Twitter account. If you uh, are into the Twitter system, uh, please give us a look and join that conversation. Also wanted to show you what the Scoop It social media uh, look like. Um, years ago, I was toying around with doing a newsletter, and I visited with someone that they have suggested to Scoop It instead. And what this does, it allows you to set up um, search words for the internet. Perhaps it's, it's livestock management, it's water quality, it's white-tailed deer management, whatever those key search terms are. And it feeds you different articles that you can select to share with your friends and those who are in the system or not. And uh, so here, you see that Blake has this feed going on. And he's had over 1.1 thousand views on his Scoop It account as well. And so for some of those folks who may not have been thinking about the Trinity River, this is another avenue that allows us to input information on a daily basis. Now, several years ago, the Trinity River Authority and the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources partnered to create the Trinity River Information Management System, or TRIMS. And I'd like for you to do a Google search for that whenever you can later on today. And uh, this is a, a very cool mapping system. You do not have to be trained in ArcGIS or anything like that. No advanced training is necessary. But uh, easy to access through the internet. It's interactive. You can zoom in on to your location in our state. Um, you can build pretty sophisticated maps of your property, see your soils, the vegetation, elevation, stream data that are in your area. And then also look at this at a watershed scale as well. 
for instance, uh, it would be interesting to know if uh, who had a close wildlife management association. Where are my neighbors that are in wildlife management associations? Well, there's a button that you can click within the trend system that shows you polygons of where those wildlife management associations are located. So if you get a chance, I'd like for you to go to trims.tamu.edu and play around with that system. We've been active with our publication series as well. I believe we have five to date. And um, I think I saw one of our authors on here earlier. Jay Whiteside is one of our co-authors from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Megan Clayton is one of our co-authors with Ecosystem Science and Management. And we have a number of others, like Dr. Larry Redman, that you heard from early on. So one of our publications dealt with the state of what was going on with the Trinity River Basin. And then I wanted a more hands-on publication with the Wetland Construction and Management publication. And then Blake has done an outstanding job linking those natural resources and good conservation practices to what it means in native grassland restoration. And so there's a series of publications on that, including different monitoring systems as well. Now, for some of you who may be doing the 1D1 tax valuation for wildlife, there's data sheets in these publications as well that will make it easy for you to report to your chief appraiser on an annual basis. Now, our outlets aren't just limited to the webinars and some of those other social media resources that I just spoke of, but I really enjoy being in face-to-face. -face. I appreciate this, this vehicle that we have with doing webinars over the internet, but I love being in front of a crowd. And so we do that as well with Trinity Waters. And Trinity Waters has partnered with Texas Wildlife Association. If you've not taken a look at have not taken a look at Texas Wildlife Association, I certainly encourage you to do that. They have a wonderful uh, education branch in their conservation legacy program. But the one where we've teamed up is learning across new dimensions in science or lands. And here um, there's kiddos that are uh, in fourth grade that are linked between Blooming Grove, Texas and White Oak Creek and some other lo locations that have expanded over the last couple of years. And it's just fantastic how our, our biologists, our natural resource professionals come to be uh, teachers in this event. It's incredible to see these kids learn about things for the very first time. And then they interact with one another. They share their experiences as they learn about uh, the different animals and plants that make up river systems and why it's important to manage them in a sound way. Uh, we also do field days. And so this is a field day that Gary and Sue Price, you see them located over here on the 77 Ranch near Blooming Grove, Texas. Uh, hosted a group there out on their property. And I think that for landowners, this is the best nickel that you can spend. If I could go learn about someone else's practices on their property, that's one thing. But if I can learn about mistakes that they made, things that they would do differently and not spend those dollars on that, that puts money in the bank account. So I encourage you to, to go meet your neighbors uh, and see what they're doing. See if you can learn a little bit about the different practices that they employ. Now, you know, I guess it's part of a Texan's makeup to be a little bit on the private side. But I know from running around different ranches, ranches on, in our state, now, sometimes you don't know the neighbor on the very opposite side of the fence. And so if I were you, I would get a plat map, I would find some resources, and, and I would certainly figure out who my neighbors were and it was, um, share a meal with them. Understand what their goals are and share yours with them. Uh, that will go a long way in, um, in doing some wildlife management. Let's visit a little bit more about some specific wildlife management practices. I want to focus the next few slides on grazing, on prairies, and on wetlands, and share some conservation stories along the way. By the way, this particular shot here is in near uh, just east of Madisonville. Uh, this is on Randy Partons, one of the founding members of Trinity Waters. And uh, in that part of the world, the Trinity is pretty large, and a lot of fishing and boating activity on the river there. Sometimes I think with our new landowners that they, they may not see the compatibilities with livestock and wildlife, but certainly that they, there are, and so it's just the management of those two things. If I'm thinking about livestock, then the very first thing I want to know is how much forage is in my pasture? How many animals can I carry in? If wildlife is a primary focal point for you, then your stocking rates are likely going to be low to moderate in density. 
And then I'm going to assess my landscape. Probably going to use trims in order to do that, by the way, and, and map out good cross fences and water distribution in my pasture so that I can get good utilization and, and maybe not cause any damage to some others that may concentrate animals. So let's take another little quiz here and see how we're doing. Which one of these pastures will yield more, yield more pounds of forage? Is it A, up here in the top, or B, down here at the bottom? Good, good. Well, that's good. I think I, I'll just, uh, I see a lot of bees over there in the chat window, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the picture down here at the lower right has much more vegetation. It's going to grow more pounds of forage. But, you know, that's a, that seems to be a, a very obvious answer. But often, as I drive across the state of Texas, I can't help but wonder, is it obvious to everyone out there? And sometimes I think that our, our stocking rates are just way out of whack. And um, sometimes I think that we're locked into a system that keeps us at a high stocking rate when perhaps a deferment is needed instead. Perhaps a, a deferment beyond two years is needed as well. And so if you've not met your chief appraiser in your area, I encourage you to do so and begin to explain some of those things. Keep in mind that our chief appraisers may not be from an agriculture background as well and may need that education as, as well. Now, that pasture in the lower B that we saw on the previous slide, that means something to this family group, right? We've got a family portrait of some cattle here. That means something to them to have forage in their pasture. All right, so let's try, let's try a different quiz right quick. How about this? Which one of these pastures is better prepared to capture and hold rainfall when it comes? Is it A or B? Yeah. Absolutely. I see the, the bees are populating over there in the chat window, and uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I can hear Steve Nelly. Steve Nelly's a friend of mine, a, a retired biologist with NRCS. I can st hear Steve talking about the differences between water catchments and watersheds. Okay, so often we talk about a river basin as being a watershed, but, doc but Nelly would he would quickly correct you there and say, no, those are basins, they're water catchments, and we want to hold that water, allow it to percolate in the ground systems, fill our tanks, uh, do good things for our pastures. Um, and so if Steve were choosing between these two, I would suggest that up here in A, he would tell you quickly that this is a watershed. This is a way to shunt water off of your property, and we see those impulses in our river systems on a far too frequent basis. Okay. Think about the forage that's lost here. Think about the soil temperatures that have gone up with the lack of vegetation here and the additional harm. is kind of a cascading event that causes us some damage. Now, many of you have probably heard about the take half, leave half, which is associated with our, our pastures and our vegetation. We're thinking about a livestock system here. But what that really means is that we take only 25% because we lose a good portion of that vegetation to other herbivores like that army worm or those grasshoppers in the lower left. And uh, it it's doesn't take too long to take too much vegetation away. And of course, when that happens, we compromise the root systems uh, on our plants. And so I just want you to pay attention to that as you drive across the state. Perhaps you're going out there to check your your deer lease, just kind of watch those things as you drive, think about these, and then become the educator yourself when you have opportunity. Wouldn't it be cool if you went out there to the ranch and you could see how much forage had been lost, perhaps due to, to herbivores, whether it's livestock or maybe it's some of those other herbivores that I mentioned, like the army worms? And so a simple technique would be to create forage cages, as you see here in this particular slide. And look, you wouldn't even have to get out of your pickup as you drive out there to help you gauge, you know, it's time to move cattle from this pasture to another one. Or perhaps it's time to consider taking some of those, those uh, some of the livestock to the cell barn and reducing those numbers. This is uh, very important when we think about um, mixing it with wildlife. So you have some other choices as producers out there as well. For instance, am I going to manage for bunch grasses, the native grasses, or the side grasses where I can maximize for haying or livestock operations better suited for me? But if we think about water, 
surface water runoff, and this is a four inch rainfall in a 30 minute time period, 24% uh, surface runoff as opposed to 45% in sod grasses. Infiltration is 75% for bunch grasses as opposed to 54% infiltration with sod forming grasses. The input cost associated with native pastures is much lower as opposed to the herbicide and other input costs associated with sod grasses. And the wildlife value is, and livestock value, well, let me take, wildlife value is very high with these native grasses. All right, you may have to reduce your stocking rate. Not as high as livestock value, but it certainly has some. Maximized over here with the hay pastures and sod forming grasses for those particular systems. So you find out where you sit on your, your scale, on your balance, and modify your own, own systems to suit your needs. Now, um, some of you may recognize this fellow. This is uh, Mike McMurray. Uh, Mike's run around the wildlife circles for many years. And uh, um, if I knew there were some folks on here that didn't know Mike, I would tell you that Mike is six foot six. But Mike's probably as tall as I am. He's somewhere around the, the 5'8 to 5'10 range instead. But nevertheless, this was a pretty high blue stem, little blue stem in this area. But there's some problems here with this particular pasture. I'm glad to see this, this little piece of remnant prairie here, but look in the background. There's some encroachment by eastern red cedar in this case that's coming into play. And so wouldn't it be great if we used livestock to knock some of this vegetation down, or perhaps there's another tool with the use of prescribed burning that would come more into play. All right, and I want to visit with you about some of those tools and tell you some conservation success stories as well. Jay Whiteside is our technical guidance biologist over near uh, Corsicana, runs several different counties over there. And Jay's been instrumental in working with his landowners to create the, the Western Navarro Bob White Restoration Initiative. And so I think if you, if you had to draw a circle around it, I would put it right there at Blooming Groves and head towards Corsicana. It's kind of the epicenter for this piece of property. But Jay has a lot of folks thinking about Bob White. And the connection back to the livestock is I can't graze that, li that grass to ground level because I'm hurting my plants, number one. But if I graze it beyond my 25%, then I'm compromising nesting cover for Bob White. And so to have good, suitable nesting habitat for Bob White, we're looking at about 400 nest clumps per acre. That's a, a piece of bunch grass that you see here. Maybe it's a blue stem, or maybe it's yellow Indian grass, or some of the others. But I need to have 400 to have outstanding nesting cover for Bob White. Most landowners, when they th are thinking about wildlife management, the very first thing that comes to mind is I've got to feed those animals. So they may scatter grain, or they may have um, spin cast corn feeders or protein feeders. That's not what we need to do at all. We need to think about that habitat first. The, the limiting component for Bob White, I submit to you, is the, the production end of it, having suitable nest locations. And so here's Mariah Box. Mariah Box is a, about a junior here at Texas A&M that works in, in the shop. And Mariah's out there pretending to be an airplane. But what she's actually doing, she's counting the number of nest clumps in her pathway so she can extrapolate those numbers to how many nest clumps there are uh, on a per acre basis. Now, the uh, Western Navarro Bob White Quail Restoration Initiative is part of a wildlife management association. And if you have not found your wildlife management association, I'd like for you to, to do a Google search for Texas Organization of Wildlife Management Associations and find those other like-minded people who may be working under the guidance of a biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, and like Western Navarro, they have a large area that's under similar management strategies. We're pretty independent people, so we're not all going to do the same things. But if we operate in a like-minded fashion, then we just increase the amount of land mass that we're managing and reduce the amount of fragmentation. So Jay's shooting for about 30,000 acres to provide for Bob White habitat in that area. And he's doing an awesome job um, in that part of the world. There's about 10 wildlife management associations in the middle portion of the Trinity River Basin that accounts for about 95,000 acres of country in that part of the world. And, and I've seen that number grow as you move across their state. Now, um, there's many of you on here. And feel free to use that chat window over there. But there are some tools of the trade associated with prairie restoration. And so, but I also want to point out that not everyone has to have a tractor. Not everyone has to have a disc. Not everyone has to have a, a cedar or a Truex seed drill. But 
working with the Wildlife Management Association or some Trinity Waters and other groups, there's sometimes common equipment that can be used. And so you may be new to the landscape, you may be new to the land, but have a high desire to have a, a pastures that are of native grasses and forbs. And so those organizations would be fantastic to seek out and use that common, common resource and common tools that they have from the seed drills to prescribed burn trailers. And also wanted to, to showcase another uh, organization that you need to take a look at, the Prescri Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas. And um, just, just play around at that website, recognize the associations where they're located in the state. Prescribed burning is an absolute must if you're doing good wildlife management. Um, this country evolved with fire. It sets back succession, makes it better for some of our wildlife species out there, and it can be done in a safe manner. And so there's people and resources like this that can help you work your way through uh, using prescribed burning on your piece of property. They use those tools to manage for different types of cover for Bob White. Perhaps it's loafing or escape cover. For Bob White, they like it pretty open, right? They like those prairie systems. So it may be anywhere from 5 to 25%. And then if you give more than 25% brush coverage, then perhaps it's time to implement some other type of practice, such as prescribed burning, um, such as the, the use of herbicides to reduce that brush canopy. There may be other times when you want to use disking to promote forb growth or grass growth for that matter. And so you can disk country two to four inches deep. Typically in the eastern part of the state we would do this in January through about the second week of March. After that uh, spring has, uh, has, is too far advanced, green up is underway. But what we would do in that part of the country is that we would, we would break the soil Typically, we would do this around the border of a pasture and use that as a fire break as well. And so you got double bang for the effort. Um, so this is a great technique to kind of set back succession, refresh a pasture. So you're not doing the entire pasture. The strip may be 20 feet wide, 100 yards long or so, placed close to cover. And you might refresh these on a two or three year rotation. Now, in this particular slide, and I believe the one to come, this shows the effects of that strip that was placed out there. Both of those are in a straight line. And uh, that's easy to do. It's easy to maneuver equipment out there. But I submit to you that, that there's not a whole lot of straight lines out there in nature. And so you're not confined to doing that. Perhaps you could have those things meandering, consider your elevations and contours, have those things kind of doing a serpentine motion out there across the pasture instead. And uh, I think that would be better served in our straight lines. But nevertheless, pretty cool photo here. Shows the uh, release of some forbs. In, the, in this case, you see uh, some woolly croton, a huge seed producer for um, a number of seed-eating birds. And it looks like they have some grain sorghum mixed in there as well. Probably going to be a good place to sit in late dove season as that woolly croton seed matures. Use of your tractor and shredder is another good option to, to shatter seeds, to spin those things out there for the next growing season. It's a good way to open up land to perhaps release some plants that have been suppressed by the, the dominant plant. Looks like a sunflower is the dominant plant here in this case, but I've seen that with partridge pea and other natives as well. And so perhaps consider meandering through there. If you're into the straight lines, maybe do a checkerboard across that pasture instead, making those resources available. Now, some of my folks out there are going to be um, more skewed to the livestock side of the equation if you're mixing livestock and wildlife. And what I want you to think about, if that's the case, and nothing wrong with that, of course, I'd love a big beef steak, but think about those areas that might not get in your way too much. Perhaps it's management along fence rows, uh, the corners of fields. Often in my mind's eye, I can see the the footprint of a center pivot irrigation. And so you have your circle. It's going to be uh, probably standing out because it's green and it receives that water. But the corners there would be fantastic habitat for a covey of quail, maybe to hold a pheasant if you're up in the panhandle area. Windbreaks, stands of trees, those are great locations to benefit wildlife on your property. And so uh, for those who are maximizing or trying to get a little more heavy on the livestock side, just think about those properties and locations that you're not using, how it could benefit wildlife. For instance, uh, right here, this is a, we're sitting on the edge of a road. We have uh, some 
low growing grasses and forbs in this area. But look at this plum thicket, a wild plum thicket that provides fantastic escape cover for quail and other songbirds. So if, um, if a quail was being chased by a red-shouldered hawk, it would dive into this plum thicket that's very close at the top, steamy at the bottom, and uh, that hawk would, would miss its meal. And so that's a great place to create cover. Some other items might be uh, plums would work just great. Uh, let's see, grapes would work just fine. And there's a number of other plants. Uh, Greenbrier makes pretty good cover for a quail, given uh, something's after them. Again, we have resources for quail management, and I want you to go on to the AgriLife bookstore and do a, a Google search for Bob White or Jim Cathy or Dale Rollins or any way you want to find information about quail. But many of our resources have those data pages that you need in the back there to, to provide uh, a report to your chief appraiser as to what's going on. Um, I want to tell you about a, a growing success story. Uh, conservation success story in the Chambers Creek area. This is a partnership uh, through Natural Resource Conservation Service and the folks with Trinity Waters are involved. This project started in 2012 and, in, and worked with the local soil and water conservation districts. Now I believe there's about $8.5 million that have been invested with landowners in incentive-based programs to carry out conservation practices that benefit the quality of soils and the, the quality of our, our water as well. And remember that I want you to carry that message to those around you that these applications in rural lands are hugely important for those in urban areas as well and provide water for many of the thirsty Texans out there on the landscape as well. Chambers Creek is located in, in Ellison, Navarro County. So you can see Corsa County here to give you some reference. Here's Waxahachie up here in this part of the world. And these uh, chambers in Rishon Creek uh, feed Rishon Chambers Reservoir. And some of you know that the wildlife management area, the Rissen Creek Wildlife Management Area, is located down here uh, just below the dam on Rissen Chambers Reservoir. Tarrant Region Water District operates that lake and provides water resources back to the thirsty folks in northeastern Texas. And so it means something to have good land stewardship up in the uplands here that ultimately filter their way down to Rissen Chambers Reservoir. And so uh, that's part of the impetus behind that particular project. Um, I, I took this photograph not too long ago from uh, uh, using the trim system. Uh, um, and what I want you to see is that the river basins themselves have been compromised in a huge way over time. It used to be that these wooded areas would extend on either side and they would be much broad. Um, these, now there's a lot of energy that comes through the system. Look right here, there's ag fields on either side that are just right up against the edge of the river system itself. This corridor that you would see that the river itself would serve as a riparian area. And so there's some management to be done, some benefit to be done on either side to slow down water whenever it comes. Think of those trees being like a huge plinko board and whenever the water hits it, it has to be diverted somewhere else and then it hits another tree. And it would slow down that energy to prevent those impulses that we see. And so the trees themselves, whether it's along the main stem of the Trinity River or along the Chambers Creek, or in this case, Mill Creek, uh, the root systems are holding that creek bank in place. And we see a nice vertical stand here. This is the system doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And so that's reducing the chances of the flooding, the reduced reduction of soil erosion as well. But that's not always the case among our creek systems. There's places along some of those systems where you're, you can see um, deep erosion of what's going on. There's a location that comes to my mind where you could put four family homes in a home in a hole that was created by this energy that uh, rushes off down to the Gulf of Mexico carrying our, our sediments with it, and in this case, filling up Rissen Chambers Reservoir. And so we certainly don't want that as well. But the benefits of managing for wildlife and our, our stocking of cattle and doing it at a proper way uh, is certainly beneficial in preventing some of those things from happening. It may be the use of a riparian buffer. And so what we see here is uh, the stream bank is, is destabilized and begins to slope down and it's lost as it falls down here into the creek system and is carried away. This is uh, Gary Price over here standing in his riparian buffer and it's uh, doing a fantastic job of slowing down rainfall when it comes. Capturing sediment perhaps from some other fields, providing great um, um, 
pasture grazing. There's eastern gamma grass and many other grasses that are in there, and fabulous wildlife habitat as well. And so that practice, I can certainly see a need to implement that more in this part of the world. There's some other things that are going on as well. Um, Tarrant Regional Water District, in partnership with Texas Parks and Wildlife, has a number of wetland cells located just below the reservoir on the wildlife management area. And these wetland cells are, are moist soil management cells that are benefiting a number of wildlife species. But the idea is there's a pump station within the Trinity River. And uh, it pulls water from the Trinity, goes through a settling pond, and then through uh, these wetland cells. And it's amazing to see the chocolate water of the Trinity River be converted to something that looks like bottled water. It's not quite ready to drink, but it's amazing the clarity of which those plants bring to pull out the impurities in that, in that water. This uh, project was, was emulated at the John Bucker Sands Wetland Center there uh, near Siegelville, Texas. And I encourage you to go and, and visit with the folks up there and see how they operate. That was done by the North Texas Municipal Water District. But the idea is still the same in water recycling from the Trinity River and also having a wildlife benefit. It's that stacking of practices that just intrigued me so. And uh, you talk about a connection between urban and rural. This is it. Um, there's that water that comes from Dallas. They use it in a big way. It's cleaned up by our plants. It benefits wildlife. And then it's shipped back into these two reservoirs, the Christian Chambers Reservoir, and, uh, and then to the thirsty folks in northeast Texas once again. It's a fantastic water reuse system. This doesn't always have to be done at the scale of which Tarrant Regional Water District operates. Perhaps you want to have wetland cells of your own. I would encourage you to get together with NRCS, uh, who understands ponds uh, very well, and these moist soil management units very well, and uh, see if you can create some of these on your own. Um, wetlands have been lost in that Trinity River Basin. And if you get on TRIMS or Google Earth or something like that, you'll note that there's some lines that parallel the river itself. And those are levee systems that were placed in there decades ago for uh, preventing farm fields from being flooded. Sometimes those levees are being uh, leveled now to uh, restore the function of the river itself. The water level in these moist soil management systems can be manipulated by a number of different devices. In this case, we have a flashboard riser. So the number of boards that you put into this device allows you to capture more water or take water off. And so uh, you see down here in the diagram, uh, this one would have one, two, three, four, five boards in it um, to capture that water. And you see that your levee is going to be at a three to one slope. We don't want those levees blowing, up, blowing out in a a flooding event. So the management of these, as we head towards the end of this presentation, the management of these moist soil management is hugely important. You want to have great plant diversity. These are seed producing plants for wildlife. This is water holding capacity for the basin itself, not just the river stem, but the basin itself. And so you might have these mallards that are flying around. So we hope to have a bunch of these coming here in the next all 60 to 80 days, um, perhaps some white geese as well. And they will tell you, you listen to them, they're telling you, we need more of the wetlands. We need more wetlands. All right. And then there's some other animals out there that would tell you the very same thing. We need more wetlands. We need more wetlands. The thing is, in this case, this flood there in Houston, you see the sign to Beaumont and to San Antonio there, downtown Houston in the background. These folks may not understand that they need more wetlands. If we had the water holding capacity along the main stem of the Trinity River Basin, then perhaps these flooding events that occur like this would not be nearly as severe. Uh, these, these things are not submarines, but they're certainly acting like it in this case. And so there's a lot of connection between our urban and rural audiences and huge value for our rural lands. And, um, but I, I submit to you that the majority of people don't make that connection. So please help us with that educational process. All that management begins in the uplands. And it begins with our good land stewardship. And I, I just applaud the natural resource agencies for working one-on-one -on -one with our landowners, instilling those different uh, those strategies, making that connection, educating our new landowners and those that are reborn to the land. and. Uh, and I would like for you to take a, a look at some of these conservation organizations that I mentioned, such as Trinity Waters, Texas Wildlife Association, and the Western Navarro Bob Quell Restoration Initiative as well. 
As I mentioned early on, this work is funded through an EPA 319 grant through Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board, and without their financial support, many of these things would just be unattainable, so there's a great appreciation that goes to them as well. And with that, Eric, I think I will turn it back over to you. Wow, that's a very great, great presentation, very good information. I think uh, Blake's going to take the reins from here, and, and maybe we have uh, some time for some questions or two, if everybody wants to type in their questions. Yeah, we'll just go with uh, with questions. If anyone has any, uh, go ahead and put them in that chat box, and we will answer them. Uh, while we wait for some questions to come in, I'll just uh, post the link for the registration page for the Trinity River Land and Water Summit again. There you go. And like I said before, this will be a, a free event. Um, and we actually have breakfast and lunch sponsored by Heritage Land Bank and Agriland Farm Credit. So a couple of great organizations uh, seeing the value of an event like this. Um, so, and then we'll also be interacting with the audience to see where, where we go from here. We're going to talk about some of the, the water quality and land stewardship issues that uh, we've been talking about in these three webinars. And uh, we, we, we really want to hear from the uh, from the landowners in those watersheds uh, between Dallas and Lake Livingston as far as where they want to go uh, from here as far as watershed planning um, and just starting to think about some of those things. So I, I just uh, did a brief uh, interruption here. I yeah. did pop in the uh, link just now in the chat box to the survey. So if everybody would like to provide a little bit of feedback as to your satisfaction with this particular webinar, that'd be great. I do have a question for Jim, though, if he's still online. It's, it, I mean, this is an amazing amount of work that's done on the Trinity River. And I'm, I'm just, it took me a minute just to capture my breath when you said back to you, Eric, before I could talk, because I was still just kind of amazed of all the efforts that's going on here. Do you, do you see this kind of effort with other major watersheds and, and riverways? Uh, Eric, there, there are some good examples. Um, but some of those examples occur in other states. For instance, the work done at the, the Chesapeake Bay, the Trinity River has often been called the Chesapeake of the Southwest. And uh, whenever you make this connection between the needs of people, the needs of wildlife, um, the needs of our bays and estuaries, I can't think of a more important river system. Now, I know that that's going to that's gonna make my mailbox fill up. There's some other, I grew up on the Brazos, and I love the Brazos River. But if you're talking about the sheer mass of humanity that rely on the Trinity River, this is it. And so um, I would suspect that the Trinity River has a, uh, they're, they're, Mass communicating, as uh, we heard in Brother Rarthal, uh, old Pappy O'Donnell, I would say that they have a much larger voice than some of the other river systems that are um, also very deserving of work in those areas. But yes, we're seeing more attention placed on watershed planning. The Plum Creek Watershed Project there in Hayes, Caldwell, um, in Travis counties is the first watershed protection plan that was done, and that's, that's uh, landowners and citizens that have come together to, to do that very activity. Others uh, are in state, like the Buck Creek in the in the Panhandle. We have Geronimo Creek near San Antonio. Yes, those things are going on now, and um, I guess I'm I'm um, uh, I'm very glad of the participation. I'm encouraged by the participation that we're seeing by our landowners in uh, the wise use of those natural resources. Very good. I'm going to also put that web link to the satisfaction survey uh, into a, a, a URL box. It's going to pop up a separate window. It should pop, pop up a browser window for you, hopefully. And it may actually pop that browser window up in front of the, um, ah, I'm getting there. Can't do two things at once. It may actually pop that window up in front of the chat box, or the, so you may have to move that out of the way. I'm doing that just for the folks who may want to participate on this 
via an archive version so they can have access to that same survey.